The president's primary argument in his brief is that when he blocked the individual plaintiffs, he was exercising control over a private personal account. We are not persuaded. We conclude that the evidence of the official nature of the account is overwhelming. The account was intentionally opened for public discussion when the president, upon assuming office, repeatedly used the account as an official vehicle for governance and made its interactive features accessible to the public without limitation. We hold that this conduct created a public forum. In resolving this appeal, we remind the litigants and the public that if the First Amendment means anything, it means that the best response to disfavored speech on matters of public concern is more speech, not less. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Okay, we have an update in the Knight First Amendment Institute case. This is the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And this is the Donald Trump Twitter case. And we're going to go through the highlighted parts of this. Yes, that's right. I took, I took some time and I highlighted this out so that we wouldn't have to read all 29 pages. We do have to go through like 20 some of them though. It's worth it. This is pretty good. This, this answers questions that everybody's had about why Donald Trump's Twitter account is a public forum, but Twitter itself is not a quote unquote, public forum for the purposes of First Amendment law. Let's find out. Let's find out why. President Donald J. Trump appeals from a judgment of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, concluding that he engaged in unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination by utilizing Twitter's blocking function to limit certain users' access to his social media account, which is otherwise open to the public at large because he disagrees with their speech. We hold that he engaged in such discrimination and consequently affirm the judgment below. The salient issues in this case arise from the decision of the president to use a relatively new type of social media platform to conduct official business and to interact with the public. We do not consider or decide whether an elected official violates the Constitution by excluding persons from a wholly private social media account nor do we consider or decide whether private social media companies are bound by the First Amendment when policing their platforms. We do conclude, however, that the First Amendment does not permit a public official who utilizes a social media account for all manner of official purposes to exclude persons from an otherwise open online dialogue simply because they expressed views with which the official disagrees. They go on to describe Twitter. The platform also allows users to directly interact with one another. For example, user A can mention user B in user A's tweet, prompting a notification to user B that he or she has been mentioned. Twitter users can also follow one another. If user A follows user B, then all of user B's tweets appear in user A's feed, which is a continuously updated display of content, mostly from accounts that user A has chosen to follow. Conversely, user A can block user B. This prevents user B from seeing user A's timeline or any of user A's tweets. User B, if blocked by user A, is unable to reply to, retweet, or like any of user A's tweets. Similarly, user A will not see any of user B's tweets and will not be notified if user B mentions user A. The dispute in this case exclusively concerns the president's use of this blocking function. The government has conceded that the account in question is not itself independent of Trump's presidency, but contends that the act of blocking was private conduct that does not implicate the First Amendment. President Trump established his account with the handle at real Donald Trump, quote unquote, the account in March 2009. No one disputes that before he became president, the account was a purely private one or that once he leaves the office, the account will presumably revert to its private status. This litigation concerns what the account is now. Since his inauguration in January 2017, he has used the account, according to the parties, quote, as a channel for communication and interacting with the public about his administration. The president's tweets from the account can be viewed by any member of the public without being signed into a Twitter account. However, if a user has been blocked from the account, they cannot view the account's tweets when logged in to their own account. 
At the time of the party stipulation, the account, Donald Trump's, had more than 50 million followers. The president's tweets produce an extraordinarily high level of public engagement, typically generating thousands of replies, some of which in turn generate hundreds of thousands of additional replies. The president has not generally sought to limit who can follow the account, nor has he sought to limit the kind of speech that users can post in reply to his tweets. The public presentation of the account and the website associated with it bear all the trappings of an official state-run account. The page is registered to Donald J. Trump, 45th President of the United States of America, Washington, D.C. The header photograph of the account shows the president engaged in the performance of his official duties, such as signing executive orders, delivering remarks at the White House, and meeting with the Pope, heads of state, and other foreign dignitaries. The president and multiple members of his administration have described his use of the account as official. The president has stipulated that he, with the assistance of defendant Daniel Scavino, uses the account frequently to, quote, announce, describe, and defend his policies, to promote his administration's legislative agenda, to announce official decisions, to engage with foreign political leaders, to publicize state visits, and to challenge media organizations whose coverage of his administration he believes to be unfair. In June 2017, then White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer stated at a press conference that President Trump's tweets should be considered official statements by the President of the United States. In June 2017, the White House responded to a request for official White House records from the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence by referring the committee to a statement made by the President on Twitter. Moreover, the account is one of the White House's main vehicles for conducting official business. The President operates the account with the assistance of Daniel Scavino, the White House Director of Social Media and Assistant to the President. His the president and his aides have characterized tweets from the account as official statements. For example, the president used the account to announce the nomination of Christopher Wray as FBI director and to announce the administration's ban on transgender individuals serving in the military. The president used the account to first announce that he had fired Chief of Staff Rince Priebus and replaced him with General John Kelly. President Trump also used the account to inform the public about his discussions with the South Korean president concerning North Korea's nuclear program and about his decision to sell sophisticated military hardware to Japan and South Korea. Finally, we note that the National Archives, the agency of government responsible for maintaining the government's records, has concluded that the president's tweets are official records. The Presidential Records Act of 1978 established public ownership of the president's official records. Under that act, presidential records include documentary materials created by the president in the course of conducting activities which relate to or have an effect upon the carry out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. The statute authorizes the archivist of the United States to maintain and preserve presidential records on behalf of the president, including records in digital or electronic form. Accordingly, the National Archives and Records Administration has advised the White House that the president's tweets are official records that must be preserved under the Presidential Records Act. In May and June of 2017, the president blocked each of the individual plaintiffs, but not the Knight First Amendment Institute, from the account. The government concedes that each of them was blocked after posting replies in which they criticized the president or his policies and that they were blocked as a result of their criticism. The government also concedes that because they were blocked, they are unable to view the president's tweets to directly reply to those tweets or to use the at real Donald Trump webpage to view the comment threads associated with the president's tweets. The individual plaintiffs further contend that their inability to view, retweet, and reply to the president's tweets limits their ability to participate with other members of the public in the comment threats, threads, threats, wow in the comment threads that appear below the president's tweets. The parties agree that, without the context of the president's original tweets, it is more difficult to follow the conversations occurring in the comment threads. In addition, the parties have stipulated that as a consequence of having been blocked, the individual plaintiffs are burdened in their ability to view or directly reply to the president's tweets and to participate in the comment threads associated with the president's tweets. I never thought I'd be saying tweets so often in a court matter. While various workarounds exist that would allow each of the 
the individual plaintiffs to engage with the account. They contend each is burdensome. For example, blocked users who wish to participate in the comment thread of a blocked user's tweet could log out of their accounts, identify a first level reply to which they would like to respond, log back into their accounts, locate the first level reply on the author's timeline, and then post a message in reply. The blocked user's message would appear in the comment thread of the blocking user's tweet, although the blocking user would be unable to see it. Blocked users could also create a new Twitter account. Alternatively, blocked users could log out of their accounts, navigate to the blocking user's timeline, take a screenshot, then log back into their own accounts and post that screenshot along with their own commentary. The district court held that the interactive space associated with each tweet constituted a public forum for First Amendment purposes because it was a forum in which other users may directly interact with the content of the tweets by replying to retweeting or liking the tweet. The court reasoned that one, there can be no serious suggestion that the interactive space is incompatible with expressive activity, and two, the president and his staff hold the account open without restriction to the public at large on a broadly accessible social media platform. As to the government control requirement of the public forum analysis, the court found the president presents the real Donald Trump account as being a presidential account as opposed to a personal account, and uses the account to take action that can be taken only by the president as the president. The court concluded that because the president and Scavino used the at real Donald Trump account for governmental functions, they exercised government control over the relevant aspects of the account, including the blocking function. After concluding that the defendants had created a public forum in the interactive space of the account, the court concluded that by blocking the individual plaintiffs because of their expressed political views, the government had engaged in viewpoint discrimination. Finally, the court held that the blocking of the individual plaintiffs violated violated the Knight Institute's right to read the replies of the individual plaintiffs, which they cannot post because they are blocked. This court reviews grants of summary judgment brand new because we agree that in blocking individual plaintiffs, the president engaged in prohibited viewpoint discrimination, we affirm. Discussion. The president's primary argument in his brief is that when he blocked the individual plaintiffs, he was exercising control over a private personal account. At oral argument, however, the government conceded that the account is not independent of Trump's presidency, choosing instead to argue only that the act of blocking was not state action. The president contends that the account is exclusively a vehicle for his own speech, to which the individual plaintiffs have no right of access to which the First Amendment does not apply. Secondly, he argues that in any event, the account is not a public forum and that even if the account were, blocking the individual plaintiffs did not prevent them from accessing the forum. The president further argues that to the extent the account is government controlled, posts on it are government speech to which the First Amendment does not apply. We are not persuaded. We conclude that the evidence of the official nature of the account is overwhelming. We also conclude that once the president has chosen a platform and opened up its interactive space to millions of users and participants, he may not selectively exclude those whose views he disagrees with. The president concedes that he blocked the individual plaintiffs because they posted tweets that criticized him or his policies. He also concedes that such criticism is protected speech. The issue then for this court to resolve is whether in blocking the individual plaintiffs from the interactive features of the account, the president acted in a governmental capacity or as a private citizen. The president maintains that since Twitter is a privately owned and operate social media platform that he has used since 2009 to share his opinion on popular culture, world affairs, and politics, and he contends that since he became president, the private nature of the account has not changed. In his view, the account is not a space owned or controlled by the government, rather it is a platform for his own private speech and not one for the private expression of others. Because the account is private, he argues, First Amendment issues and forum analyses are not implicated. Although Twitter facilitates robust public debate on the account, the president contends that it is simply the means through which he participates in a forum and not a public forum in and of itself. No one disputes that the First Amendment restricts government regulation of private speech, but does not regulate purely private speech. If in blocking the president were acting in a governmental capacity, then he may not discriminate based on viewpoint among the private speech occurring in the account's interactive space. As noted, the government argues first that the account is the president's private property because he opened it in 2009 as a personal account and he will retain personal control over it after his presidency. 
However, the fact that governmental control over property is temporary, or that government does not own the property in the sense that it holds title to the property, is not determinative of whether the property is, in fact, sufficiently controlled by the government to make it a forum for First Amendment purposes. C. Southeast Promotion Limited versus Conrad, a Supreme Court case in 1975, holding privately owned theater leased to and operated by a city was a public forum. Temporary control by the government can still be control for First Amendment purposes. The government's contention that the president's use of the account during his presidency as private founders in the face of the uncontested evidence in the record of substantial and pervasive government involvement with and control over the account. First, the account is presented by the president and the White House staff as belonging to and operated by the president. The account is registered to Donald J. Trump, 45th president of the United States of America, Washington, D.C. The president has described his use of the account as modern day presidential. The White House social media director has described the account as a channel through which President Donald J. Trump communicates directly with you, the American people. The at White House account, an undoubtedly official Twitter account run by the government, directs Twitter users to follow the latest from POTUS, real Donald Trump and his administration. Further, the POTUS account frequently republishes tweets from the account. As discussed earlier, according to the National Archives and Records Administration, the president's tweets from the account are official records that must be preserved under the Presidential Records Act. Second, since becoming president, he has used the account on an almost daily basis as a channel for communicating and interacting with the people and public about his administration. The president utilizes White House staff to post tweets and to maintain the account. He uses the account to announce matters related to official government business, including high-level White House and cabinet-level staff changes as well as changes to major national policies. He uses the account to engage with foreign leaders and to announce foreign policy decisions and initiatives. Finally, he uses the like, retweet, reply, and other functions of the account to understand and to evaluate the public's reaction to what he says and does. In sum, since he took office, the president has consistently used the account as an important tool of governance and executive outreach. For these reasons, we conclude that the factors pointing to the public, non-private nature of the account and its interactive features are overwhelming. The government's response is that the president is not acting in his official capacity when he blocks users because that function is available to all users, not only to government officials. However, the fact that any Twitter user can block another account does not mean that the president somehow becomes a private person when he does so. Because the president, as we have seen, acts in an official capacity when he tweets, we conclude that he acts in the same capacity when he blocks those who disagree with him. Here, a public official and his subordinates hold out and use a social media account open to the public as an official account for conducting official business. That account has interactive features open to the public, making public interaction a prominent feature of the account. These factors mean the account is not private. Accordingly, the president excluded the individual plaintiffs from government-controlled property when he used the blocking function of the account to exclude disfavored voices. Of course, not every social media account operated by a public official is a government account. Whether First Amendment concerns are triggered when a public official uses his account in ways that differ from those presented on this appeal will, mo will in most instances be a fact-specific inquiry. The outcome of that inquiry will be informed by how the official describes and uses the account, to whom features of the account are made available, and how others, including government officials and agencies, regard and treat the account. But these are concerns for other cases and other days, and are ones we are not required to consider or resolve on this appeal. Once it is established that the president is a governmental actor with respect to his use of the account, viewpoint discrimination violates the First Amendment. The government makes two responses. First, it argues that the account is not a public forum and that, even if it were, individual plaintiffs were not excluded from it. Second, the government argues that the account, if controlled by the government, is government speech not subject to First Amendment restrictions. As a general matter, social media is entitled to the same First Amendment protections as other forms of media. Whatever the challenges of applying the Constitution to ever-advancing technology, the basic principles of freedom of speech and press, like the First Amendment's command, do not vary when a new and different medium for communication appears. A public forum, as the Supreme Court has 
also made clear, need not be spatial or geographic, and the same principles are applicable to a metaphysical forum. To determine whether a public forum has been created, courts look to policy and practice of the government, as well as the nature of the property and its compatibility with the expressive activity to discern the government's intent. Opening an instrumentality of communication for indiscriminate use by the general public creates a public forum. The account was intentionally opened for public discussion when the president, upon assuming office, repeatedly used the account as an official vehicle for governance and made its interactive features accessible to the public without limitation. We hold that this conduct created a public forum. If the account is a forum, public or otherwise, viewpoint discrimination is not permitted. A blocked account is prevented from viewing any of the president's tweets, replying to those tweets, retweeting them, or liking them. Replying, retweeting, and liking are all expressive conduct that blocking inhibits. Replying and retweeting are messages that a user broadcasts and, as such, undeniably are speech. Liking a tweet conveys approval or acknowledge of a tweet and is therefore a symbolic message with expressive intent. Significantly, the parties agree that all of this expressive conduct is communicated to the thousands of users who interact with the account. By blocking the individual plaintiffs and preventing them from viewing, retweeting, replying to, and liking his tweets, the president excluded the individual plaintiffs from a public forum, something the First Amendment prohibits. The government does not challenge the district court's conclusion that the speech in which individual plaintiffs seek to engage is protected speech. Instead, it argues that blocking did not ban or burden anyone's speech. Specifically, the government contends that the individual plaintiffs were not prevented from speaking because the only material impact that blocking has on the individual plaintiff's ability to express themselves on Twitter is that it prevents them from speaking directly to Donald Trump by replying to his tweets on the at real Donald Trump webpage. That assertion is not well grounded in the facts presented to us. The government is correct that the individual plaintiffs have no right to require the president to listen to their speech. However, the speech restrictions at issue burden the individual plaintiff's ability to converse on Twitter with others who may be speaking to or about the president. President Trump is only one of thousands of recipients of the messages of individual plaintiffs who seek to communicate. While he is certainly not required to listen, once he opens up the interactive features of his account to the public at large, he is not entitled to censor selected users because they express views with which he disagrees. The government's reply is that the individual plaintiffs are not censored because they can engage in workarounds, such as creating new accounts or logging out, etc. Tellingly, the government concedes that these workarounds burden the individual plaintiff's speech, and burdens to speech as well as outright bans run afoul of the First Amendment. When the government has discriminated against a speaker based on the speaker's viewpoint, the ability to engage in other speech does not cure that constitutional shortcoming. Similarly, the fact that the individual plaintiffs retain some ability to work around the blocking does not cure the constitutional violation. Neither does the fact that the individual plaintiffs can post messages elsewhere on Twitter. Accordingly, we hold that the president violated the First Amendment when he used the blocking function to exclude individual plaintiffs because of their disfavored speech. Finally, the government argues that to the extent the account is controlled by the government, it is government speech. Under the government speech doctrine, the free speech clause does not require the government to maintain viewpoint neutrality when it speaks or its officers or employees speak about government endeavors. For example, when the government wishes to promote a war effort, it is not required by the First Amendment to also distribute a contrary message discouraging that effort. It is clear that if President Trump were engaging in government speech when he blocked individual plaintiffs, he would not have been violating the First Amendment. Everyone concedes that the president's initial tweets, meaning those that he produces himself, are government speech. But this case does not turn on the president's initial tweets. It turns on his supervision of the interactive features of the account. The government has conceded that the account is generally accessible to the public at large without regard to political affiliation or any other limiting criteria, and the president has not attempted to limit the account's interactive features to his own speech. In other words, he hasn't turned off replies or turned off following or privated the account or something. He's made it quite public, as well as all this other stuff. Considering the interactive features, the speech in question is that of multiple individuals, not just the president or that of just the government. 
when a Twitter user posts a reply to one of the president's tweets, the message is identified as coming from the user, not from the president. There is no record evidence, and the government does not argue that the president has attempted to exercise any control over the messages of others, except to the extent that he has blocked some persons expressing viewpoints he finds distasteful. The contents of retweets, replies, likes, and mentions are controlled by the user who generates them and not by the president, except to the extent that he attempts to do so by blocking. Accordingly, while the president's tweets can accurately be described as government speech, the retweets, replies, and likes of other users in response to his tweets are not government speech under any formulation. The Supreme Court has described the government speech doctrine as susceptible to dangerous misuse. It has urged great caution to prevent the government government from silencing or muffling the expression of disfavored viewpoints under the guise of the government speech doctrine. Extension of the doctrine, in a way urged by President Trump, would produce precisely this result. The irony in all of this is that we write at a time in the history of this nation when the conduct of our government and its officials is subject to wide open, robust debate. This debate encompasses an extraordinarily broad range of ideas and viewpoints and generates a level of passion and intensity the likes of which have rarely been seen. This debate, as uncomfortable and as unpleasant as is sometimes frequently may be, is nonetheless a good thing. In resolving this appeal, we remind the litigants and the public that if the First Amendment means anything, it means that the best response to disfavored speech on matters of public concern is more speech, not less. The judgment of the district court is affirmed. So I thought that was a very remarkable story. Uh, what did you guys think about it? Let us know in the comments below. I know it was a little bit long. We'll try to edit it down as best we can, but that really explains the difference. We get a lot of questions. Well, if the president's account is a public forum, why isn't all of Twitter a public forum? It's the actions of the user. Can Leonard French go make his account a public forum? Well, yeah, if I become a politician, succeed in being elected to office, and then begin using my private Twitter account for official government functions, I will now have fallen under this ruling. However, if I am not a politician or other government actor, then my tweets won't matter. So how could... What's a fringe case here? Well, maybe somebody is a supplier of government services and they start using their personal Twitter account to, to communicate official things about the government services that their company provides. Maybe they could turn it into a public forum there because people would need to discuss the government actors' behavior and such in supplying the government or something like that. That's less of a clear case, but you can see how it would be extended is what I'm getting at. That is our show for today. Nico, you want to get up? Yeah, we have two very, very scared doggos because we have a, uh, a thunderstorm going on right now. I don't know if Nico is scared. Nico has just been he also laying won't move. She's, just a, she's a brick log. Brick, a brick log, everybody. Nico! My, uh, my dog is a brick log, everyone. I have, I have officially created a new, a new phrase. I, of course, am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses with me, Leonard French. Thank you very much to our Patreon and sponsors and other supporters. In July, we have a $500 plus supporter, Joshua Davis with Tanda Pay. We're working on a video for him about his social insurance program that's based on blockchain technology. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Richard Fortier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, and Snorri Wazatsky. Something in the back of my nose there. <laughs> 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 All right, this is what happens when we try to film later in the day. It's like everyone's just... <laughs> and thank you to our $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. And everyone will appear in the description below. So thank you all for joining me. I'll leave some room for... We, we, we now have a dog pool party video of Nico in a shark life jacket. It's got like a little shark fin on the back of it. So we'll post that with the end of, in the outro of the videos. Love you all. Have a great Wednesday and a great rest of your week. We'll see you in the videos that drop and on Sundays at 10 a.m. on twitch.tv slash lawful masses. And I guess now Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, same place. Love you all. 
This has been Kaylee in the real studio and then Tactical and Brandon in the virtual studio. Thank you much for joining me, everyone.